All right, um, we've got another great video in the Optimize Tavern series with uh, Dr. Andre Pop, the master of tavern efficiency. Um, we're going to be talking about fully catheter use. So, Andre, take it away, bud. Okay. Um, so, fully catheter use, uh, something that we all started back in the old days. Um, it's kind of funny. I uh, We're celebrating uh, tomorrow, actually, 10 years of Taver and 1,400 Tavers. And wow. I reached out to my uh, surgeon who started a program with us, who's now moved to Pennsylvania. And the guy is like, oh, do you remember those days when we're doing Tavers together and it was four hours per case and whatever? Yeah. And they had everything. They had a swan. They had, uh, you know, an ET tube. They had a Foley. They had everything you can think of. Um, and all the complications that come with that. So uh, Foley clearly came from open heart surgery uh, from the days when uh, procedures took a long time. Uh, these days, procedures don't take a long time, and uh, we're using a lot less anesthesia. So TAVR patients these days are much more similar to your regular cath lab patient than to a open heart surgical patient. Uh, also, especially if you're dealing with older men, which we're all dealing with, Putting a Foley is not risk-free. Um, it's sometimes difficult to put a Foley in. By the time they call somebody who, is, uh, who can get it in, the, the prostate has been traumatized. They start bleeding. They're hurting. It delays your procedure. And then after you give them 10,000 units of heparin, they don't stop bleeding. And then you're going to keep them uh, in the hospital for a few days to deal with that. Uh, sometimes you just take the Foley catheter out and then they can't urinate and then they have urinary retention and then uh, urology gets involved and it's quite a, uh, quite a mess. Um, putting a Foley in if the patient has a retention after the procedure is not a big deal and there's no increased complications with that. So um, that is a very reasonable thing to do. So um, basically, um, these are the uh, indications uh, for placing uh, catheters. This is from up to date. And I kind of um, uh, show you that um, they're uh, all the indications that they list that would even remotely apply to TAVR don't apply. So there is no reason to monitor their uh, intra or post-operative uh, urine output. Um, and really, basically, there's no reason to put a Foley based on uh, the most uh, current uh, evidence. And as you guys know, all hospitals are trying to deal with Foley's. Anybody who has a Foley, you get multiple alerts in the EMR saying, take the Foley out. Why is the Foley in? And I'm like, I'm the cardiologist. What do I know? <laughs> um, so... Um, this is uh, the best data we had until recently. Uh, I think a very similar procedure to uh, TAVR uh, these days is doing a AAA endograft. And uh, basically, these guys looked at the data and said that the universe adverse effects uh, were lower uh, along, among patients who don't have a Foley to start with. And there were no problems if you put a Foley afterwards. So... Um, Interestingly enough, they're talking about same-day discharge for AAA endografts. Uh, we are certainly talking about same-day discharge for TAVR. Uh, the same thinking applies. There's no reason to put a Foley in on an elective basis. Um, another paper that looked at AAAs, and uh, it's showing you that uh, there's no reason to put uh, AAAs in routinely for a procedure, which, again, in many cases is very similar to uh, TAVR. Um, if you're uh, looking at the uh, TAVR literature, this paper tells you that urinary adverse effects were frequent in patients who got a Foley, and they were associated with significant mortality and longer hospital stay. So really, you're not achieving anything by putting a Foley in. Uh, in fact, you're hurting your patients. Um, so uh, these are, this is the conclusion. Uh, there's no way to justify routine Foley use uh, for TAVR. Uh, for routine for use goes against the guidelines and does more harm than good. Uh, you can certainly do Foley's in selected patients where there's a good reason for it, but you should not do it um, uh, in routine cases. And even when you have a complex TAVR, um, 
there's probably no reason to put a Foley or procedure is not going to take six to eight hours. Uh, so even if you're doing a transcarotid, even if you're doing a transapical, uh, there's no reason to put a Foley in routinely. Mm-hmm. So that's all I got. Thank you. I love that, Andre. Thank you. And Aiden, I don't know if you remember when we were fellows in the partner three days or the partner okay. one days, we had a bladder perforation as fellows in a patient. I remember and that. And they died. They died. I was on call that weekend. I'll never forget it. So what you said, Andre, it's not benign and there's no good having a, a fully functioning bioprosthetic valve if you ruptured your bladder or you're bleeding out your penis or, you know, <laughs> have a catheter associated infection. So I totally agree. No, I mean, and these patients, you know, once you've started the prostate and bladder cascade, it takes a while to yeah to heal. Then there's that big bag of yeah. water running through there. It's warm. yeah, and the urologist comes once a day and he's like, "Oh yeah, we'll continue it for twenty four hours." And you're like, no. "My length of stay is out the window." And yeah. why did we do this in the first place? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, but it. I think it's like everything. We all were part of those early taver days, and it's like. All these extra lines, all this other stuff, it just leads to problems. And uh, everything you minimize with these patients is is quicker recovery. So, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that you know it's it's incumbent upon all of us to keep up to the with the data and to to look even at the less um, you know glamorous parts of towers. You know, I mean, all three of us are doing. LV pacing, all three of us are doing radials, we're doing all sorts of stuff that a few years ago was very revolutionary. But, you know, I was reading today, actually preparing for another uh, presentation on uh, antibiotics and uh, infection control before TAVR. And the guidelines are different from what we've been doing. You know, they're recommending different antibiotics than what we've been using. Uh, They're uh, recommending broader spectrum coverage to cover enterococcus because the uh, infectious endocarditis after TAVR is different than infectious endocarditis after SAVR. And I just emailed my valve clinic coordinator. I was like, are we doing this? Because, you know, when was the last time you looked at the antibiotics that they get before TAVR? You know, I mean, it just... It happens by magic, right? But nobody is actually putting enough thought into this. So I think it's important for all of us to keep an eye on everything that's happening and uh, update our protocols as new evidence becomes available. What is the antibiotic? Because we still use two grams of ANSEF in most people. Well, so actually ANSEF is not effective against enterococci. So they're recommending uh, amoxicillin clavulonate. Wow. Okay. Oral? Uh, IV. Okay. Or Unison, probably, right? I think yeah, it's I don't know what the, Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that might be Unison, yeah. All right. Andre, Love thank you. you very much.